Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hello, everyone. I'm Nick Claridge, and welcome to another edition of Emergency Medicine Cases Rapid Review. This is part two of low and slow poisonings, and today we're going to talk about digoxin. We're going to briefly recap the differentials for low and slow poisoning from part one. Then we're going to go over the workup for digoxin toxic patients, as well as go over some important pearls in the history, the ECG findings, and as well as what to do about those dig levels. And finally, we're going to move on to the management of a dig toxic patient. To recap from the last video, we have a patient with a low blood pressure and a low heart rate. What are we thinking? To make the differential easy to remember, you can split them up into tox and non-tox causes. For the non-tox causes, think about MI with cardiogenic shock, hyperkalemia, hypothermia, spinal cord injury, and mixed edema coma. With most of these, you'll be able to figure it out with history and a physical exam and a quick ECG. Next, there are the tox causes, and these can be elusive, especially if the history is not there. We talked about the big three, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and digoxin. Then we also talked about opioids, alpha-2 antagonists, as well as some sodium channel blockers like TCAs and cocaine. Today, we're going to focus on digoxin. What do you need to know about the workup for a dig toxic patient? Well, we'll focus on three elements of the workup and give you some great pearls. There's the history, the ECG, and the blood work, specifically the dig level. The findings here are going to differ depending on if it's a chronic or acute overdose. And it's important because the chronic DIG patients have a higher mortality and they can be really tricky to pick up on. So for the history, you might get a history of a large ingestion and that's going to be easy in the acute toxic patient. However, it's the chronic patients that might elude you. They tend to have vague symptomatology, stuff like the dreaded weak and dizzy or altered level of consciousness, nausea, or some visual symptoms. What might help is that if you think of the triggers, DIG gets excreted by the kidneys. So think of it in someone who's on DIG and is volume depleted, like from vomiting or diarrhea. Also, DIG interacts with lots of other drugs. So patients on DIG who just started new medications can become toxic. What about the ECG findings? Well, it's the important to know between the difference between the DIG effect and DIG toxicity. Because the DIG effect does not mean the patient is poisoned. You can see these findings in a patient who has a therapeutic level. It's sad, but the first time I heard about Salvador Dali was in the context of digoxin. The iconic mustache is etched in my mind and how it resembles the scooped SD segment in the patients on digoxin. The DIG toxic patient can almost have any dysarrhythmia except for rapid atrial fibrillation. The acute poisonings tend to cause hyperkalemia, so the ECG findings can reflect this, whereas the chronic toxic patients tend to have low potassium. Also, the acute patients are more likely to have ventricular dysrhythmias, specifically biventricular tachycardia, as we can see here in the rhythm, th rhythm strip, whereas chronic is more likely to be bratty. Broadly speaking, the types of ECG can changes can be split into myocardial irritability and AV blockage. Some of the rhythms you can see here are slow atrial fibrillation, biventricular VT, frequent PVCs. And for the AV blockade, you can see junctional rhythms, AV disassociation, and heart block. Pretty much anything. So you've considered the diagnosis, and you want to get some blood work. But how helpful are the digoxin levels? Well, there are some pitfalls in interpreting these levels. You can get both false positives and false negatives, and they're important to know. First, the digoxin levels will always be falsely ele elevated if taken within six hours of ingestion, so you have to wait greater than six hours to draw your first level. Also, after digifab is given, the levels will always be falsely elevated. For the negatives, that the chronic digoxin patient will have a normal dig level. Keep in mind that the non-digoxin cardiac glycosides like Foxglove or Oleander will also have false negatives as well. You've taken a history, you've examined the ECG, and you've gotten some blood work, and now you want to manage this patient. How do we do this? So for the patient that is bratty and hypotensive, our experts recommend a fluid bolus, trying atropine 0.5 mg IV, but moving quickly to digifab. There's little role for pacing because of the increased myocardial irritability, and there's a risk of deterioration into a malignant dysarrhythmia. But if atropine has failed and you're waiting for digifab and the patient is hypotensive, it may be considered, but make sure you go with a very low energy. For the acute poisonings and you have a ventricular dysarrhythmia, you can also consider IV lidocaine or esmolol. So you're thinking about giving digifab. What are the indications? 
So a potassium level greater than five. Yeah, I know only five, as well as if you have a history of a greater than 10 milligram ingestion in adults and greater than four milligram ingestion in children. Also renal failure, as well as ventricular dysrhythmias or unstable atriorrhythmias, or if you get that high ditch serum level. The other case would be a patient who's taken multiple ingestions and you're just trying to get DIG out of the picture. For the dosing of Digifab, there are three scenarios we have to consider. The pulseless patient, the acutely poisoned patient, and the chronic poisoning. For the pulseless patient, we want to give 10 vials and then repeat in 15 minutes if needed. For the acute patient, you want to give two vials and then repeat PRN. And finally, for the chronic patient, you want to give one vial and then repeat PRN. What about the stone heart? Is calcium safe in the hyperkalemic DIG patient? Chronic DIG patients are more likely to have hypokalemia. So if the chronic DIG patient is hyperkalemic, then it's more likely due to renal failure. So giving these patients calcium is likely safe and won't cause a stone heart. In the acute patient, DIG toxicity can cause hyperkalemia. These patients do not need anything to stabilize the cardiac membrane or shift the potassium. What they need is Digifab. So that wraps it up. Remember, it's important to distinguish between acute and chronic overdoses. The history can give you clues, and think about the chronic toxicity in the weak and dizzy patient on digoxin. The ECG findings can be anything but rapid atrial fibrillation, and you can split them into myocardial irritability and AV blockade. And there are false negatives and positives when getting the levels that are important to consider. Finally, move to Digifab quickly. This will help you out. Thanks, everyone, and hope you enjoyed the low and slow poisonings. See you again soon. Thank you.